Gosh, it's it's such an honor to be here and and to see your names and or faces chiming in. Um, it's just such an honor to, uh, to be blessed with your all's with your all's presence. Um, I'm calling in from from Colorado, just outside of Boulder, here on the Front Range, where the Rocky Mountains meet the plains along um, what's called Left Hand Creek. But I am known to give that creek many, many names. Sometimes it changes by the day. But, uh, but on maps, it's called Left Hand Creek, named after Chief Left Hand, Arapaho. Um, before I jump into just sharing a, a, a story or two, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself um, and some of the, the big moments, if you will, that have put me on my path and and to some degree really brought me into the study of mythology. So when I was 20 years old, um, it's coming on 20 years ago, it's uh, crazy to think about. Um, when I was 20, I first studied with a man named Tom Brown Jr. And he has a wilderness survival school, wilderness living school on the East Coast in, in New Jersey. Uh, he's written several books some of them field guides, some of them novels, all to do with nature connection. And I was exposed to his work when I was 12, somewhere around there, and then did my first course with him when I was 20. Um, I've continued to study with him as recent as two months ago. And when I did my first course with him, um, it was probably the first time in my life that I had. I actually felt like I belonged. Um, like I was in a group of people that were in love with the same thing that I was, um, that heard the same drumbeat um, out there on the edges of civilization and the wilderness. And I was given and taught all these skills, mostly in that course, physical skills, um, meaning shelter, fire by friction, flint napping, simple traps, edible plants, pottery, basket making, um, the list goes on, physical ways to interact with, with nature. One thing they say at his school, the tracker school is, um, survival is the doorway to the earth. Um, and so that, that door got unlocked and opened and I walked in it. Um, and, and I've been, I walk through that door um, every day. At the end of that course, Tom asked this question. He said, um, he asked us if we were living our vision. If we were living our vision. And you know, he's a dramatic character and he, he's incredibly inspiring. And he has a, a very commanding presence. But he asked us, if you had 24 hours to live, would you be doing what you're doing right now? You know? And if you feel like you wouldn't be doing what you're doing right now, then it's then you're you're not following your vision. And it's time to go follow that vision. You know, so at 20 years old, highly educated but capable of nothing, um, I really began to ask myself, oh my gosh, you know, am I living my vision? And that sent me on a path that I, that I, I walk today. Um, I guide vision quests. I started guiding, well, within three years of Tom Brown asking me that question, I was on a vision quest. Um, eight years after that, I started guiding them, a modern day wilderness rites of passage. So the theme, this conference being reimagining education, if there's a voice that I can bring, it is, is really this sense of what is there that the earth can teach us directly about our own visions? Is there, um, I don't wanna say curriculum, but is there a current out there existing in the natural world that we can plug into that um, will teach us exactly what it is that we need to know to fulfill our visions. And um, oftentimes when I guide people out into the wilderness, most of the first days are this process of unlearning. 
this is like we're just unlearning all the all the stuff that's in the way from us getting real contact with life where our senses all of them are doorways and rivers and highways of information of knowledge so years of, of being a student pursuing a master's guiding in the field um, the fields of wilderness education of wilderness therapy um, of rites of passage and gap year uh, uh, body-based rites of passage myth came into my life about five or six years ago kind of out of this prayer of like how how do i map out um kind of these the, the process of change um, especially coming from the wilderness you know uh in 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 the initiatory model of severance threshold and incorporation um incorporation always is the hardest part for most people because it's not quite clear what we're being initiated into. <laughs> a couple hundred years ago, it was really clear uh, what you were being initiated into, and it's not so clear these days. Oftentimes, people come out of the wilderness going, I am so clear on what I have to do, but then there's no container, no culture of which what I want to bring can fit inside of. So all of a sudden, we got to learn how to make the basket to then fill the basket up. So it's, it's kind of an interesting time. And myth began to provide some of this language for me of which I could express these deeper truths in. Myth became this basket of which I could fill with these far out ideas that occurred to me in the wilderness. So that's a little bit of um, background, a little bit of an introduction. And I would love to to tell a story um, or two. Uh, we'll see how much time we have. But before I jump into that, I, I um, am a sucker for hearing everybody's voices. And if anybody is inspired or touched or moved or wants to share just a little something, just a little something, um, you know, under a minute or two uh, about what I just shared, um, it can be open for right now. And then I'll jump into stories. So, so I, I'm a, a screenwriter. I'm working on screenplays and possibly a novelization of one of the screenplays. And these themes are very uh, important in some of my themes of what I write. So that's, that's, that's why I'm here. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, all right. Just keep it open for another minute or two if anyone else wants to chime in. Um, well, I'm, I'm here because I did a vision class that mm. was not the usual vision class, so not going up the mountain and staying uh, by yourself without eating, although I would love to, it just just didn't happen. It hasn't arrived in my life yet, but I would love to. But I did this very intellectual and artistic meditational thing for 10 weeks that really, like I put my, my inside out and it, had, it has really transformed me. It was in the, at the beginning of the pandemic. So um, I'm very into rites of passages and having us being more celeb. This society just making more celebrations and understanding our cycles, I think, um, having that kind of mind and rituals would bring us is a direct way to connect to, to nature. Um, so um, um, I really want to hear your stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you calling in from, Anna? Um, I'm in Brazil now. Ah, Brazil. Okay. Okay, I have many friends down in Brazil. 
Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, and I just opened up the chat and um, I seen that you um, asked a little bit more about the process. I'll just share real quick, uh, you know, broad sweeping uh, explanation of severance threshold and incorporation. So severance is the period of time um, when we are removed from the familiar. So in my work, it's bringing people out into the wilderness. So they're leaving this sense of what is familiar, what is comfortable even, um, beginning to sever themselves or separate themselves, you know, um, establishing some sense of distance so one can have perspective. Yeah, um, on their lives. So in times of old, this was, you know, when the boys or girls um, were, were taken from their parents' house and, and brought into these makeshift camps in the forest where the initiations took place. Um, severance in modern day and how it works with me is it's the time where we begin to, uh, where I begin to teach ways to commune with nature. Because as Charles Eisenstein would say, we're, we're living in a story of separation. And so how is it that we reconnect and begin to understand how nature communicates to me, to us, and how nature, how I communicate with nature? Uh, we really begin to slow things way down and fall into the rhythm and cadence and heartbeat of the earth. And that becomes a time when we prepare our intention. What called me out here to go into the wilderness? Why am I going out into the wilderness? I believe that inside the call, meaning I am called to go do something, inside the call resides our own visions, our vision, our purpose. And so we begin to explore what is it that's calling us here? And, um, and then you go out and the threshold, the, the threshold stage is the middle stage where it's four days and four nights out in the wilderness, where it's between and betwixt. Um, it's a conscious experimentation of one's intention or a conscious dialogue with the fecundity of the unknown. Um, mysterious things can occur in that space. And then incorporation is this return. What happened for me out there and how am I going to bring this home? Yeah. Yeah. What happened for me out there and how am I gonna bring this home? Um, which, is, which is the hardest part, as I was mentioning. It's like, it's not clear what we're being initiated into these days. Um, I just did uh, a workshop, my partner and I taught a workshop actually out in Vermont and it was all about incorporation. It was all about, because the root of incorporation is corpus, which is the body, yeah. And it was all about how do we bring our visions into the body, into form, into the manifest world. Yeah. So that's severance threshold incorporation. Was really articulated um, by an anthropologist named Arnold Van Gennep. If you're interested in exploring that in the academic uh, format. So cool. And so just, just to uh, connect with the myth storytelling, um... What, what, what is the relation? So um, you mentioned the myths being uh, the stories that um, nature tells us and we've been telling for ages and centuries and that's how you know the bioculture memory of earth gets passed on. And I also think maybe of the myth that we create about our own lives. So the narrative that we create and the stories we tell about us. I mean, Anna, like my myth of my own life. I don't mm -hmm. know, I just started think, thinking about the relation between the rituals, the rites of passage, and the, yeah. the mythic part. Maybe, I, maybe I, I guess you're going to talk about, about a bit more about this. Uh, maybe, I don't know. But what I can say is something that myth provides is an antidote to fact. And fact is often fixed. It's often really fixed. Um, and can very easily swing into dogma, personal facts about our life or those out in the world. And mythology is moving and fluid and relational. 
nature is fluid, moving, and relational. And so myth provides us a way to drop into the grander story of life and our interior in a way that um, is not fixed. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, you all ready for a story? Okay. Um, I'm going to close the chat because I, because I get distracted. Um, hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> so once upon a time, there was a kingdom. And inside this kingdom was a king and a queen. And they were the type of king and queen that were deeply loved. They were cherished. They were admired. They were noble in the truest sense of the word. They were loved by their people and the people loved them. So, <laughs> there was a dark secret, however, that moved through the kingdom. It was one of those secrets that everybody knew, and that was that the king and queen could not create a baby. And it troubled them. It troubled them very deeply. And it was late one night that the queen was wandering through the forest. She, her heart was heavy and she was underneath the moonlight, wandering through an old oak grove. And out from behind a tree comes an old grandmother. She says, oh, my dear queen, my dear queen, it seems that melancholy has fallen upon you. I can see with my eyes of an elder that you are troubled, that you are unable to bring new life into the world. Now, the queen feels kind of vulnerable in this moment. She says, how did you know? How could you, how could you know that just from seeing me? Well, grandmothers know these things. And the queen says, look, can you help me? Is there anything that I can do? My grandmother says, yeah. You know, the mantle above your fireplace, there is an old dusty chalice. I want you to pull that chalice off the shelf, off the mantle and polish it, clean it and go out to the garden. And I want you to blow your longing to whisper your longing for new life into this chalice. And before it can leave, I want you to tip that chalice upside down in the garden and leave it there overnight. When you wake up in the morning, pull that chalice up and underneath it will be a red rose and a white rose. Whatever you do, do not eat the red rose. Eat the white rose. Eat the white rose, and sure enough, you will become pregnant. So the queen goes back, finds the chalice, cleans it off, goes out to the garden, Blows her longing, her deepest prayers, her tears, her heart's desire into this chalice. Before it can leave, she turns it upside down and leaves it there. Some say she went up and crawled into bed with the king and they sung sweetly into the evening. She woke up in the morning. She wandered down to the garden. She lifted up the chalice and sure enough, there, growing out of the ground, was a red rose and a white rose. 
and she reaches down to go eat the white rose and something lustful takes over every cell in her being and she plucks the red rose and gobbles it and it's like enters her body and she's like oh my god that felt good and then she goes oh my god what have i done what have i done i ate the red rose i was told there was one rule and it was not to eat the red rose and that's what i did well the king is there her husband and he says honey don't worry about it just eat the white rose too and we'll forget all about the red rose and that's what she does she eats the white rose and sure enough, her belly begins to swell. And the weeks go by, and the months go by, and the weeks are counted, and everybody is getting incredibly excited for the new life that is about to enter the land. And it's that day of her birth. The midwife is there. There is a whole chamber in the castle for giving birth. And the midwife is there and she's saying, push and breathe and push and breathe and push and breathe. And all of a sudden she sees something coming out of the queen and without saying a word to anyone, she grabs this little snake that has come out of the queen and tosses it out the window. Everyone is so preoccupied with the queen that they don't even notice. And the midwife peers up into the eyes of the queen and says, there you go. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep breathing, keep pushing. And sure enough, in a few moments, out comes a beautiful baby boy. right into our world. Precious, adorable, happy and healthy. And this young prince grows up with the most loveliest childhood. He's able to go anywhere he wants. He is taught, he is able to go down into the mead cellars of the castle. He is able to go up to the tallest windows. He is able to play in the garden and go out into the woods. He learns sword fighting and hunting and horse riding. He learns everything. And it comes to that time when he is to ride out and court a soon-to-be princess. And so he loads up his carriage with Sufi poetry, with incense from India, with silk from Kashmir, with rugs from Konya, Turkey. He's got it all. He's got all the goods to court a princess. And he rides and he gets to a crossroads. When he gets to the crossroads, this huge snake emerges from the forest, breathing steam, red eyes, and yells, older brothers, marry first. And the young prince thinks to himself, this is kind of odd. I'm just going to go a different way. And so he turns his horse and all his carriages and rides down another path, gets to a crossroads, and sure enough, the snake is there. And he says, older brothers, marry first. He says, okay, this happens one more time. And decides to go back to his parents, the king and the queen. He says, look, I'm just curious. Do I have an older brother? I said, no, absolutely not. We are certain 
you do not have an older brother. So, okay. So the next day he goes out and he takes a totally different path and a totally different road, all another direction. And sure enough, he gets to a crossroad. Sure enough, the snake shows up. Sure enough, the snake says, older brothers marry first. Scares the heck out of this young lad. He does this two more times. And finally, he goes back to his parents and says, look, I'm pretty sure I have an older brother. Who else can I talk to? And they say, well, we've told you the truth, but if it's helpful, you can go talk to the midwife. And so he goes and talks to the midwife and he tells her the whole story. And she says, oh yeah, actually I had forgotten all about that. When you were born, what came first was this little tiny snake that I just unconsciously tossed out the window. And he says, okay. So he calls down his parents, the king and the queen, and says, look, this is what's happening. And the king says something remarkable. He says, let's make a room in the palace. Let's make a room in the palace for this snake, for your older brother. Let's actually see if we can get him married. And so to call that wild one out of the forest, they send the poets, they send the musicians, and they court this snake out of the wild and into the castle. And they send word out. They send word about a prince that wants to get married and brides start showing up. Potential brides start showing up. And one by one, they all disappear. In fact, what happened is they would open the door the following morning of them spending their first night together and there would be a huge lump in the belly of the snake. And so after six or seven months, all of a sudden word spread out that all these women are disappearing. And nobody wanted to show up to get married to this mysterious prince. Troubled, deeply troubled, the king rides out. And he's riding in the country and riding on his horse and, and it's, it's, it's like he was in the south of France and there was that golden light on the grasses. There was a beautiful young woman out in the fields. And he thinks to himself, maybe this one will marry this wild son of ours. And he rides to the house and her father is there. And he says, look, I have a great honor to bestow upon your family. And it would be that your daughter marries my firstborn son. And the father goes, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I know the stories. All these young women are disappearing. They are disappearing. My daughter will not go. And just at that moment, with a basket on her hip, she walks in the door and she says, no, father, I will marry this one. However, I will not come for a year and a day. She had no idea where this came from. It just came out of her. I will come in a year and a day. The king is overjoyed and rides off. A few hours later, this farm girl is wandering through the forest going, what have I done? I have no idea how to prepare for this. 
And as she's wandering, a grandmother comes out from behind an oak tree and says, granddaughter, I can see you are troubled. This is what you must do. You are to make by hand a wedding dress every single month. From now until when you show up at the castle. Each one finely embroidered with the mysteries of each month hand sewn. And when you show up, you are to bring with yourself a bucket of lye water, ash and water, and a bucket of fresh milk. Now at this time in this place where this story occurred, it would take eight months just to produce one wedding dress eight months to produce one, and she had to produce 12 in a year. So she got to work, and that's what she did. And a year and a day went by, and sure enough, she shows up, she walks into the room, there is a huge snake there, and what does he say? Take off your clothes. And she says this, I will take off my dress if you shed a skin. And the snake thinks to himself, well, nobody's ever asked me that before. And he starts to wiggle, sheds a skin. And he kind of represents a different part of our brain and says, now take off your clothes. And she says, I'll take off my dress if you shed a skin. Because what she had done is she wore all 12 wedding dresses at the same time. And so this went back and forth. She kept saying, I will take off my dress if you shed a skin. And she did this until she had one wedding dress left. And the snake, the snake at this point was a translucent, amorphous kind of blob. And what did she do? She pulled out that bucket of lye, which is caustic, which burns. And she pours it on this blob of a snake and she pulls out a metal brush and she begins to scrub this snake. I mean, the screams are still heard today in a hundred years of forgotten initiations. And she is scrubbing and she is scrubbing and she is scrubbing until she runs out of all of that lie solution. And then she does something very special. She pours that bucket of fresh milk all over this blob. And by doing that, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, muscles begin to form. Out of that blob, bones begin to form. Organs begin to form. Hair. Essentially, a young prince takes form. And standing there, they look at each other astonished at what had taken place. And so they make it through the night. Some say they laid in radiant contentment all night long. And the king and the queen in the morning opened the door, expecting to find a snake there with a lump in its belly. And they see a man and a woman, humbled and common, just as you and I. Smiling underneath the bedsheet, saying, what's for breakfast? 
It's Sunday morning. Let's make something special. Maybe pancakes and blueberries today. And they went on living. And they say that these two, the young prince and the princess, reside deep within us. And where the story goes from here is actually up to each one of you. It is actually up to each one of you. And so as far as this story goes, and for now, that is all I know. Hmm. So let's take a few moments. Take a few moments just to, to kind of ask yourself, what scene really jumped out to me? Where did I enter the story? Where did I leave the story? Um, there are so many details in this story that we can be explored. And we'll have a little discussion here. We'll have a discussion. Um, it's open. You can say this line inspired me or really drop into it and, and, and we'll just begin to make the story bigger. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and chime in when, when you feel ready. For, uh, for me, it was the grandmother this time. And the, the process of the uh, young farm girl leaving her family really brought me into it this time. And it was just so much courage that she took to leave her family. And then once she got out into the woods, she was just like, oh no, what do I do now? I have no clue. And just had the complete faith in this grandmother that she met to make these dresses, you know, and um, the detail that really stood out was embroidered them with the details of each month. So it's like in these 12 months, she got to see the full cycle of the year, mm. all of its uh, full cycle of nature in all of its different, uh, you know, each season, each creature, each uh, thing that comes in the 12 months and put it in those dresses. So it's almost like, uh, you know, this was the wild snake that came in and she like learned lessons from the wild and embroidered them in her layers uh, to, it's like wild meets wild almost. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, which I hadn't heard, that, you know, this is, I've heard this story many times and this time this really like, yeah, really stood out for me, her courage and her, rite of passage, you know, her vision quest, 12 months out there uh, working really hard. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful, Dan. Yeah. 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 You know, that, that the grandmother, you said the grandmother caught your attention and, and there's something about this story because she shows up like, wait a second, is it the same grandmother? <laughs> Grandmothers can be tricky, you know? <laughs> And um, is it the same one? Is it the same as the midwife? Mm. But th there's something about this story that suggests having a grandmother around is a good idea. Mm. Yeah. You know, and it's like, um, you know, how, how blood grandmother or not, like how many of us spend time with elder grandmother women that, that carry mysteries and send us on, you know, impossible tasks? of 12 wedding dresses, you know? 
uh, th there's something about the story that suggests a valuing of elderhood. Mm. You know, and there's something I'm thinking and bringing this up freshly because, um, you know, reimagining education. It's like, where are the elders? Where's that elder wisdom? This mm. story has it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Um, the story reminded me a lot of. Uh... I don't know the name in English, but um, that book by Clarissa Pinkola stays running with wolves. I'm not sure yeah. if that's the name in English. Um, of course. In the way, in the way that the myths, um, if you just look at them like superficially, they're just crazy. Like what? What do you mean? A crossroad, and then what? Rose, and um, and then each detail has got like this whole universe of meaning behind it, um, and they all somehow teach at least this one myth by Clarissa um, is one of the one that really stuck with me is about intuition. Um, and this story also, what became, what was strong for me were two things. So this um, deep trust in mm. authority or, and what should happen. So when the prince, like the, the snake blocks him several times, he's like, I'm not crossing. Like I will abide by the snake that is here or the king and queen, they hear that they like the first newborn should marry. They said, okay, so the first newborn will marry. It's, it's like this authority, not being a person, not only a grandmother, but you know, the, like destiny or what needs to happen and say, okay, that will happen. And also um, the soon to be princess embroidering 12 dresses. Okay, I will take on that task. Like this is what need what needs to be done even though I don't know why, even though it seems crazy, even though like I would just do it. Um, so it's a beautiful trust in life itself. Um, and the second thing that st struck me was, it, I could really, I, somehow I could feel it when the, the skin, like the snake is all, it's like a blob. And, and when she pours that uh, acidic, um, mixture and I could feel like my my skin was burning with it I was like oh my god the snake is just gonna dissolve and and die and but then no but then the milk comes of course milk and uh, other relation to maternity of course um and a person is formed like there's a creation of a person that was first rejected that was first yeah. an, an error yeah. that was first something wrong and that got you know tossed aside and forgotten um and when you bring and and then that's that animal part of it that like eats women and and will continue to be this beast would continue forever until this um person who has received the the this like this gift this wisdom can come and just encounter it and and fight with it you know i don't know it's just yeah it's um yeah so yeah these two things um stick with me Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It, 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 in some ways it implies healing. Healing requires both. It, it inquires the, the lie, but also the milk, but also the milk. And I, I think sometimes we forget about the milk, you know, I think we forget about the milk. I think we, we, we want to do the hard, deep work. We want to, we want to dig deep. We want to do that. But like, where's the celebration? Where, where's the nourishment? Where's the, the milk and honey, <laughs> you know, where's the butter on the, on the bread. And so it, it, it the pancakes and blueberries. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's something this story implies both are required. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, there's, I'll just speak a little bit. And um, Allison, I'd love to hear your voice at some point. Um, you know, there's, there's an old idea that uh, there is a wild part of ourselves that we have to encounter at the time of initiation. Um, that lives out in the unknown and is dangerous. I think about um, the movie Avatar, very popular movie. 
and he goes through his initiation and he like gets to the top of the top of those floating mountain islands and he's about to um, find out which one of his birds i think they're called banshees those birds that they pluck their braid into um, and he has to find his and he asks his teacher somebody's like how do i know which one is mine and it's the, one of the most fascinating lines in the whole movie because he says it's the one that's going to try to kill you and so there's a quality that like our wild twin our genius our destiny, our purpose lives out in the wild and we have to encounter it at some point in our lives, you know, that that was the time that was culturally orchestrated. If we go back far enough in our, in our, in our lineages, you know, uh, there was culturally orchestrated rites of passage or initiation where we could encounter that wild twin, you know, um, there's also this part of like, bringing that wildness into civilization or culture. And it's something that, I mean, what first popped in my head was the agricultural system, but this is about education and this, but, but about, edu uh, about the agricultural system, it's like none of our plants have resiliency because they're no longer carry that wildness. You see what I'm saying? Dig what I'm saying? Yeah, they're they're monocropped and 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 all of that, and it's like very fragile because of that. Very fragile. There's not much diversity, and so this story that's that you know, like for the king and the queen to say, "Let's make a room for this one from the wild to be here," is a remarkable thing. You know, it uh, it didn't happen to me growing up, and I think in a lot of ways I identify like, yeah, I was the wild one in the classroom. My head was out of the window. I was watching the birds. I couldn't pay attention. I could pay attention, but, but it's not what I wanted to pay attention to. And my attention was always drawn somewhere else. Um, I recently remembered a story of my own life being in kindergarten. And kindergarten, you know, we're, we're hanging out on a, on a big rug. We're all in a circle. And, um, and I was talking to a a friend or a buddy. I don't remember who I was talking to. Somebody I was talking to in my class and I was telling them a story and the teacher, an awesome teacher said, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Darren, you're interrupting my class. And I looked at the teacher in kindergarten and said, excuse me, you're interrupting my story. You know, just like that. And it's like, there's a certain wildness in that. I'm not glorifying my, my, six-year-old self but as much as like does education have room for that wildness in, in all of us and, and and do we do we have a still intact part of us that represents that kind of wildness that's gonna like break at the seams you know um those are two parts that really stood out to me just to to bring in more thoughts and things to consider another thing i just thought of that's really big is like what the hell is the red rose you know and, and why is it that any time we're told not to do something, we do it? You know, and why is it the thing that we're not supposed to do that brings the brings new life in some way? It, it, these are all questions. Certainly don't have any answers. But um, there's more thoughts to feed to the story. Um, yeah. Hmm. Anything you'd like to share, Allison? Yeah, I was, I was, I guess I was interested in that part of the story, the, the temptation of, uh -huh. um, the red rose and the white rose and whether the old woman knows that the red rose is going to be the one that's chosen mm -hmm. and being irresistible and and call, brings so much pleasure and mm. yeah just um yeah i just was thinking about what that meant you know mm. um, 
why that's the irresistible choice. Even if, you know, the, the, the greatest desire this woman has is to have a baby, but she still goes for the red rose, you know, it's, it's interesting. Hmm. I don't really have a, a more formed thought about it, but yeah. Yeah. Neither do I, other than that there is a good kind of trouble we all need to be engaging in. I think this whole conference is oriented towards the good kind of trouble. Yeah. You know, there's something about that red rose. It's like, it's the good kind of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Thanks, Allison. It's nice to hear you. Where are you calling in from? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. All right. Yeah. Any other scenes, thoughts, images? It can be simple. It doesn't have to be a big explanation to, for anybody in the group here. Moments. Well, I thought the snake was going to kill the baby. <laughs> what, what, what baby? I mean, when the, when the snake comes out of her, that made me go, yikes. Um, oh, and then I thought, oh, that... oh no, shit, the snake's going to kill the baby. She shouldn't have eaten the red rose. Although that's what gave her pleasure. No. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Another one for me is when the prince was trying to evade the snake, it tried so many different routes. Uh -huh. And even the next day, it went back out and tried a completely different route. Uh -huh. So it's like all these different paths to really avoid this confrontation until finally it was just like this confrontation is inevitable. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of like the surrender of that. I know we talked a lot about like the faith but I feel like the prince did some hard work to try to evade the snake, you know, so also kind of the hard work and then surrender uh, into the hard work that is really needed, you know, beneath the skins. Um, although, yeah, the prince, yeah, the snake is the one that did the real hard work, uh, which is also interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that touches, I don't have anything more to say. Like, I, I don't know if I can, it's just like, man, how often I'm trying to outwit. Out, I was talking to a friend today and I said, um, cause we're, we're getting ready to do uh, sweat lodge tonight. And, and, um, and I said something like, you know, creator or God is, is, it always shows up like as trickster for me. And she asked why. And I said, because I'm too smart for my own good. And I will rationalize my way out of any lesson that I think I need to learn. Like, I'll always do that, you know? And, but I'll get tricked into my healing. And, it, and this showed up with what you're saying, like, man, he tried so many ways. And inevitably, the damn snake was there. It's like, man, I try all these ways to get out of everything, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm laughing with resonance behind the muted uh, thing. So yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. Um, do y'all want to hear one more story? Do, do you want to hear another story? Yeah. No. Yeah, okay. Um, let me think of a. Huh, um. Yeah. Ah, I got it. I got it. This is the thing is, is a, is a pretty long story. Um, and the end is really clunky. Here we go. 
Once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a father. There was a father and son, and the mother had recently passed, had recently crossed over into the other world. And this father was a merchant, so he was busy a lot of the time. And within a year, he had actually remarried. And so the son, the son had a stepmom, and this stepmom really didn't like him, really didn't like this boy. And so she goes, you know, I need to hire a tutor to watch over this young lad. So a tutor is hired, tutor comes, and tutor says, what are we to do today? And she goes, um, take him down to the ocean and go fishing. Why don't you all go down to the ocean and go fishing? And so they go down to the ocean and cast their line. And all of a sudden, this flotilla of 30 ships start approaching the shore. And I kid you not, on each ship is the most beautiful woman that this young lad had ever seen. He was awestruck. And the last ship actually was made out of gold. And there was a woman there that was more beautiful than all of the women combined. And she comes up and she gets right to the shore and she says, Ivan, is that you, Ivan? And of course, this young teenager is going, she knows me? Oh my God, she knows my name? How do you know my name? Who are you? And she goes, Ivan, I've been looking for you for years. We are destined to spend our lives together. I will come back tomorrow at the same time. And she's off. Ivan is skipping the whole way home. He is elated. His heart is flying out of his chest. It was as if his heart, poof, was carried like full sails over an open sea, and he was carried across the land. And his stepmother sees this. And she calls the tutor and she says, what happened today? What happened today down by the ocean? He says, oh, nothing. We went fishing. It was great. She goes, no, no, tell me what happened. Oh, nothing. Oh, nothing. Tell me or I'm going to fire you. He goes, well, you know, 30 ships came all with beautiful women. The last one had the most beautiful women on this whole wide world. And um, she says that she's been looking for Ivan for a long time and she's going to come back tomorrow at 2 p.m. She's going to meet him after class. And she goes, okay, okay, this is what you have to do. And she pulls out a pin. And she says, tomorrow, right before the ships come, you're to take this pin and slip it into Ivan's tunic. Don't do this. You're fired. Done. So the next day they go down. It's about 158. In the distance, they can see the ships. The tutor puts the pin in Ivan, the collar of Ivan's tunic. And all of a sudden he goes, wow, I am just so sleepy. I'm so sleepy. I, 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 and next thing you know, he's down on the beach and he has passed out cold. Of course, the maiden jumps off the boat. Ivan, it's me. It's me. And she tries to shake him awake and nothing. I mean, he is out cold. Nothing is waking Ivan up. A little bit offended but more so excited to come back the next day, the maiden gets back on her ship and she's gone. 
all 30 ships are gone. Tudor pulls out the pin. Once they're out of sight, Ivan wakes up, goes, man, what happened? I just got so tired. What happened? Did they come? Did I miss her? The tutor says, yeah, yeah, she came, but you just got so tired you passed out. You know, maybe we'll try again tomorrow. And sure enough, this happens another time and another time. Hmm. And then finally the maiden comes. She can't wake him up. And she writes a little note and she says this. She says, Ivan, I've come for many days now. Your stepmother and your tutor have betrayed you. I am in the land <laughs> of three times nine plus one. If you want me, you will have to find me. And she gives the note actually to the tutor. And she's off. He pulls out the pin. Ivan says, where are they? Where are they? I don't know how I fell asleep again. She goes, I don't know. She left, but she wrote this note. Tutor gives it to Ivan. He opens it up and he reads it. And within half a second, he pulls out his sword and clean cuts the head right off the tutor. One swipe. And Ivan decides he can't go home. And he wanders. And he's wandering through the forest and he's wandering until he comes upon Baba Yaga's hut. Now, Baba Yaga is the wild witch of the forest and her house actually sits on one chicken leg and hops around, typically with a fence around it that has human heads on it. And Ivan looks around and he sees 12 posts and 11 of them have heads on them. A little bit ominous feeling that his may be the 12th head. And he can hear Baba Yaga coming because sometimes she's home and sometimes she's not. And if you know about Baba Yaga, she sits in a mortar and she rows with a pestle and there's a broom behind it that covers her tracks. And there she is coming. He can hear her cackling. <laughs> I can smell the flesh of a human. I can smell the flesh of a human. And she lands right in front of Ivan. I smell the flesh of a human. I can't wait to eat you up. I can't wait to eat you up. Let me ask you, young lad, did you come here on your own volition? Or did somebody else send you? Now, that's a question we have to ask. But why is it that we're here in this conference? Did you come here on your own volition? Or did somebody else send you? Now, this is the thing with Baba Yaga, is if he answers any one of those questions, what's going to happen? He's dead. Absolutely done. So this is what he says. Oh, grandmother, oh, grandmother, you know it's not courteous to ask a guest questions without feeding them first. Baba Yaga goes, oh, oh, you're right. Because even gods and goddesses have to follow certain rules. And so she feeds him. And Ivan eats because he's hungry because he's been wandering. He hasn't been home for quite some time. And she goes, okay, okay, okay. Tell me, did you come here on your own volition or did you come here upon someone else's? And he said, grandma, I came here 82% on my own volition and 77% on someone else's. Because in this world, it doesn't have to add up to 100. Bobby Yaga goes, sheesh, we got to leave a real live wire here. Got a real live one. He goes, grandma. 
I'm curious. I'm looking for the land of three times nine plus one. Can you tell me where it is? She says, no, no, no. I have no idea where it is, but I have a sister, if you didn't know. And she's just down the way. You'll know you're near her hut because she likes to sharpen her teeth with a file. The sound, the sound is a little bit eerie. You'll know it when you get there. And Ivan is off with a belly full of food, walking down the path. Sure enough, he hears that sound of teeth being sharpened with a file. And this one Baba Yaga sister said, oh, wow, I smell human flesh. I smell human flesh. What is it that you come here for? Are you here on your own volition or someone else's? Basically, what she's asking is, what the hell is your purpose in life? You know? And he says this, grandmother, you know, you can't ask a guest questions without feeding them first. She goes, ah, you're right. You're right. So she feeds him. She goes, okay, it's time for me to ask my question. He says, look, I'll answer your question if I can ask a question too. And she says, the deal is done. Tell me, did you come here on your own volition or someone else's? And he says, uh, I came here 82% on my own and 77% on someone else's. Baffles her completely. She says, okay, what's your question? She says, I'm looking for the land of three times nine plus one. Do you know where it is? She says, no, I don't know. But I have a sister. She lives just down the way. She, I think, knows. But you be careful with the ones, man. She's really mean. She'll eat you to pieces if you're not careful. I'm the sensitive one. And Ivan is wandering and she goes, by the way, don't forget to blow her horn. Ivan's wandering, he's wandering, and sure enough, comes upon another hut, certain there is that cackling, oh, I can't wait to eat a young, naive boy. Why is it that you come here on your own volition or someone else? And he says, Grandma, you know, you, you can't ask someone questions unless you fed them. So he gets fed. She goes, okay, time for me to ask my question. He said, yeah, I'll answer your question if I can ask you a question. And she says, deal. She asks a question. He says, 82% of my own, 77% on someone else's. You know, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not black or white. I live right down the middle. And she goes, huh, what's your question? She says, can I blow your horns? And she says, uh, sure. So real quick, Ivan runs to the three horns and he blows them all really hard. And when he's done blowing the third horn, he hears this sound. And in comes sweeping the firebird. The firebird is the guardian of the dawn and of dusk. In other words, the firebird is the protector of thresholds, the protector and guide between this world and the other. And the fire herd is, bird is yelling at Ivan, quick, jump on my back or she's going to eat you. And Ivan runs, jumps on the back of the fire bird and is off. And I don't know if it was an hour. I don't know if it was a year. I don't know if it was a 10 years. But Ivan is on the back of the fire bird and the fire bird drops Ivan off at the doorstep of a grandmother, a grandmother like you and I would want to see. So he's back in our world. And he knocks on the door and she swings open the door and she says, can I help you? And she looks at him and she goes, ah, why, don't, why don't you come in? And she feeds him. She says, what do you need? He goes, I'm looking for the land of three times nine plus one. There's a maiden there that I saw many years ago, a golden ship. She said, our lives are to be destined to, to live together. And she goes, huh, funny you say. 
She happens to be my daughter. And he goes, um, well, do you think she still likes me? I mean, it's been a long time and I fell asleep every time she showed up. I was fast asleep and uh, I think I've matured enough now. And um, I, I think I'm ready for her. And she goes, ah, I don't know. She'll be here in a couple of days, you know, and um, uh, maybe I can um, turn you into, uh, uh, this is actually what the story says, I can turn you into a nail, boom, and I'll, and I'll hit you into the side of the wall, and when she comes, um, uh, uh, I'll ask her if she still remembers you even, or if she still likes you, and you can hear the answer for yourself. She says, okay, sounds like a good idea. I'd be willing to turn myself into a nail. And um, a few days later, she comes. The grandmother transforms into a nail, pounds him in the wall. This young maiden sweeps in, and it's like she's carrying a breeze of a thousand songbirds in his heart. I mean, he's just a nail, but he's lit up from head to toe. And the grandmother, her mom, you know, she says, um, hey, you remember that young lad, Ivan, you had a crush on, you know, um, um, do you still like him? She goes, huh. My love for Ivan is inside an oak tree. And inside the oak tree is a casket. And inside the casket is a duck. And inside the ducket, the duck is a rabbit, and inside the rabbit is an egg. And my love for Ivan is inside that egg. I have no idea what any of that means, other than the only other time I know that rabbits have eggs are Easter, which is derived from a goddess in Scotland. So the young maiden leaves. Ivan is transformed uh, out of being a nail. The grandmother says, it looks like you're going to have to find that oak tree. You're gonna to have to find that oak tree. And he wanders and he follows that innate sense that lives inside each one of us. And sure enough, he finds that oak tree. And he finds the casket and he finds the duck and he finds the hare and he finds the egg. And he brings it back to the grandmother and the grandmother then decides, hmm, we're gonna have a party and I'm gonna invite my daughter and all of her friends. And um, that's what she does. They have a party. And all of her friends come, in fact, they say that when they came, it was 30 swans that flew through the window. And the grandmother made 29 hard boiled eggs. And she saved that one egg that Ivan had found in the oak tree and she prepared it especially for her daughter. And they go down to eat and the daughter cracks that egg and she starts to eat it and she gets overwhelmed with this feeling of love for Ivan. And she goes, mother, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm out of my mind for that rascal I met so many years ago on the high school basketball court. I can't get him out of my head can't get him out of my head. Um, do you know where I could find him or what? I don't know. I don't remember anything. And just at that moment, Ivan walks through the door and they are reunited. Now, the story goes on from there, but I don't know the ending because I don't know if there is an ending to love like that. And so where the story goes from here, is up to us. So as far as this story goes, that is all I know. So
So um, let's do what we did last time and kind of spend some time like what images caught you, what moments touched you. Um, we'll feed the story, make it dynamic and, uh, and see where it takes us. Yeah. Doesn't have to be long, doesn't have to be something you know. It's just, man, this scene caught me. Yeah. <sighs> the casket in the oak tree. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something about the, the full potentiality of the egg and death hanging out right next to each other. Yeah. I think what I, what made me think about bringing up this story is it's the tutor. The name of this conference is Reimagining Education. And it's like, where the heck did our teachers long ago put that thing in our tunic that put us asleep? You know, and that brilliant moment when as soon as he find out, Ivan found out he was betrayed and he didn't waste any time. Just like gone with the head. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that we're all in this conference in some way um, tells me that we, that, that we pulled out our sword at one point in time. Yeah. Another one was the question that the Baba Yaga kept asking, you know, mm. did you come on your own volition or did somebody force you to be here? <laughs> and, you know, what's going on with that? Why do they keep asking him? And why does his answer stump them so much? You know, mm. is there a, you know, is there a real answer to that? And, mm. uh, you know, that, that question kind of stumped me like, oh, what, there's a lot in there in that simple question. And the way he responds to it. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of where I really got brought in. Um, mm. yeah. You know what, what in the, in the earth-based philosophies of vision, um, uh, what, and, and this comes from the lineage that I walk with, um, you know, what happens is we don't get answers to questions we ask, we just get awareness. And so what happens when we get our questions answered is we no longer remain awake. It's like, oh, it's done. I got the answer. Don't have to think about that one anymore. Yeah. And so there's something like in the riddle of like, grandma, I ain't giving you that answer straight on because I'll go back to sleep again. You know, I'll go right back to sleep. I got to keep it a little bit like a little bit wild here. You know, 82% uh, and 70 says like, who comes up with that? You know, it's definitely not going to work on Wall Street. You know? Yeah. Anyways, does that land? Does that kind of feed that? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I like the uh, Baba Yaga part of it, just because I had a, a, I had a book as a child that... Mm. Baba Yaga and with incredible illustrations and it's very very vivid for me with the chicken leg and and how terrifying she was and yeah I'm just curious to know like the origin of that is she Russian or yeah yeah Russian more, more about that that witch figure yeah 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 Yeah, she's she's an initiating thing. She's like a she's 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 just no she's no bullshit. She is full of wit. Like to meet Baba Yaga, you have got to have your wits with you, or you're done. You're done. You know, completely. You're one of those heads on those posts that are fenced at her house. Yeah. 
Yeah, the tale I, I said before about from Clarissa from her book that about intuition is the one about Baba Yaga. Uh, um, so, Princess Vasilisa. Yeah, uh, because yeah. she receives the, the intuition doll from her, um, the mother that protects her more than sends her into challenge in life. And then she goes off to the forest and she, right? Um, and in that regard, I, the blowing the horn, um oh, yeah. it, it got me because like you can you can you you can be wit you witty and, and say 82 percent and 77 percent but that cannot go on forever there's there's got to be a point when i don't know and blowing the horn and then you call like you've he he was called to that mission but then he also sort of calls the firebird mm. uh that is the uh, you know the the messenger between worlds, and then he finally gets to the the grandmother he wanted. <laughs> so another <laughs> mission, right, to the oak tree. But then, yeah, he, he can finally find um, the girl. And when and when at the beginning he was on the beach, and the girl arrives, I'm like, it cannot be that easy. It's not. No, nah. <laughs> no, nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> uh, right. Um... One time I told this story, um, a woman courageously said something. I mean, I, I could have believed it floored me at the time. She goes, yeah, I have each one of those three Baba Yagas inside of me. And each man that needs to find my heart has to pass through all of them. I'm a horrible person. You know, it was like a realization. She was like, I don't like this about me, but I realize this is what I've done. You know, I try to kill every single one of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah interesting it was really it shocked me floored me that she said that you know so wow wow yeah maybe maybe, maybe it's good maybe it's a good way i don't know you know yeah <laughs> hmm. Hmm. why do you have any thoughts Oh, thank you for inviting. <laughs> I was trying to uh, think about our time. Uh, I know we are close to 6.30, but as yeah. we said earlier, we can stay stay on. And uh, yeah, lots of thoughts. Uh, I was trying to think of the two stories, the other, you know, how they are woven. I know, Darren, you, you really thought about what story to tell, you know, and um, I keep imagining how, how they relate. And for me, um, you know, this, um, I don't have exact sentences or anything, but the words that are resonating uh, with me is, you know, wildness hmm. uh, and um, the, the absence of the elders. Um, and certainly, um, you know, I, I love this. Um, it's like this sensation of not having answers, right? And I, I, I was wondering about this wildness being like, you know, uncultured. You know, this mm. sort of right, like, and through this education, supposedly we're, we're being cultured, and like the <laughs> the contradiction of it, right? And mm. we're trying to search for answers. Uh, perhaps to be, you know, prepared for this, uh, supposedly this wild, you know, wildness out there, but it isn't. It's very much controlled environment. And so we are prepared, we as in like perhaps the students are supposedly being prepared with answers, but, you know, that is going to be like, you know, the, um, you know, removing us from uh, communing with nature. So having this, you know, we're put to sleep, as you said, <laughs> you know, so I, I really, you know, and how, how this opened up um, um, this, imagination you know as you know as i was thinking that we okay we're coming to this uh to the end of this day and but without having any answers i like that we are left with awareness uh, of imagining 
And I think that takes us to, you know, the next step and next step and next step. So, um, so yeah, th thank you so much for uh, <laughs> sharing this story. Uh, I, I never thought about this in relation to education, but I think this, this opening, you know, <laughs> uh, the egg being the, right, the sort of potential and the death, you know, the egg may be the education. <laughs> it could be either. <laughs> so I like that image that left uh, with, so. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so honored for all of you for coming and um, coming to this and, and, and being willing to lend your ear to some old stories and um, uh, to share your voice um, is, is a courageous thing too and, and to listen to mine and I'm, I'm just so grateful uh, to have spent this time with each of you and, and um, yeah. Uh, overwhelmed with gratitude and, a, and a, a, a deep longing that I hope to see all your faces again somewhere down down the road. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Darren. Uh, and um, yeah, I didn't mean you know mean to close this space, but uh, to carry on this energy, if you know I, I put it in the post. Uh, chat that we invite you all to share your thoughts in this um, um, sort of questionnaire. Um, that'd be wonderful. So mm. thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure meeting you all. And I dropped a link to Darren's website in the chat as well. Yes. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Learn more about Darren. Yes. Uh, that's a good way. Yeah, and I have to say this is my favorite session of the whole thing. So thank oh. you so much. It just brought me to deeper places outside of my mind and more into my body and my imagination. Um, mm. So yeah, thank you so much for blessing us with this gift. And uh, yeah, I'm excited that it was recorded as well. So it can be shared with others and uh, mm. more people can kind of tune in. And mm. So yeah, thank you. Big, big thank you for being with us. Yeah, brother. Uh, always an honor to, to share space with you. So, thank you. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I, wanted, yes. I wanted to, to thank you for the session. Uh, I was having a bit of a crappy afternoon. And it just got me thinking about the relation to education as to you know, what Dan was saying, that it brought him to a deeper place. And that's what I just wrote there. Um, and I just realized why. And it's, it's the mm. same feeling. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to Chinese New Year uh, in Sao Paulo. And mm. I was just amazed at, you know, with the martial arts and the dragons and the lions. And the, the kid inside of me was amazed. It was just like, <gasps> and, <laughs> and the mythic storytelling brings together the, my child and my Baba Yaga, my, my ancient, my elder inside of me, because it connects mm. this, you know, um, whoa, this awesomeness uh, with this very deep wisdom, deeply connected in, in, in nature. And I think that's why it brings us this like in, in feeling of entirety. Like I feel entire now. I don't know how to explain that. Um, and like a wholeness. I, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I constantly and society and work and myself, I constantly forget about storytelling in that sense. Um, so thank you for reminding me and us of this beauty. Really. Thank you so much. <laughs> ah, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Um, and, uh, you know, my my partner's son um, is half Brazilian. And so his, his sister lives in uh, Lumia. You know Lumia? Um, anyway, I have connections to Brazil that I, that I, I actually see her face in you. So it makes me, um, <laughs> this has made me happy to see you here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. 
All right. See you all soon. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.